All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. This is the Northampton City Northampton Urban Forestry Commission meeting. Um, March, I was going to say February 15th. It's, I'm looking at the minutes. It's March 1st, 2023. Um, and um, we have... Uh, a guest speaker this evening, uh, Professor John Rogan, who we will welcome shortly. Um, we have some members of the public, uh, Jackie Balance and um, Devorah. If you do, either one of you have any public comment you'd like to share at this time? Hi, Jackie. And Devora, hello. Thank you for being here. Hi there. No comment. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, I did send out the minutes from our last meeting. Did everyone get them and mm -hmm. got them? Fine. Okay. David, did you have to get a chance to review? Uh, I did, yes. I just had one question or comment about the Conway School students. Yes, sir. Um, uh, it wasn't clear what town they were focusing on. And I don't know if they they didn't tell me. They didn't tell you. Okay. No, it was sort of like um, they didn't. They didn't come right out and say it, so I didn't want to ask. I wasn't exactly sure if they were on their fact finding mission. They weren't. Maybe they were told they were not allowed to reveal the town they were working for. I don't know, so I didn't ask. It was a smaller community than Northampton, though I believe. So okay, could be any of the three hundred fifty one fiefdoms in Massachusetts. So um, okay. So with that, I will, if, if no one else has any questions, is, uh, is there kind of a motion on the floor to accept the minutes as presented? I so move. May I have a second, please? Molly. I'll second it. Uh, is there any discussion? No discussion. Okay. Uh, Bonnie, could we please have a roll call? Sure. Rich. Yes. Susan. Yes. Molly. Yes. David? Yes. And Jennifer and Rob. They are not presently. Sue, did you hear from either one of them that they were not going to be at our meeting? I don't think so. Hmm. Yeah, neither, neither did I. Okay. I will text them. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see. Uh, chair, chair report, tree warden report. Um, I don't really have anything new to report new to talk about other than a couple, couple things um i am not we are not going to be on city council meeting tomorrow night um and i, I will follow up with the mayor's office to see if we are going to end up if the sto will be presented for the next council meeting which would be the thursday so i think it would be the 16th would be the thursday um but i actually saw the mayor today but i was not it was not for an official visit it was uh for a retirement function that I didn't ask her. Um, the, um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is that I, I spoke with uh, Kent today um, for about an hour about uh, the tree data, the uh, tree planting data that uh, we've, that Kent's been distilling from the spreadsheet that we put together. Uh, and Kent has a few more uh, pieces to put into that uh, document before we will sh we'll share it with the rest of the commission. One of the things we're waiting for is the data dump from um, Davy Resource Group, which I am actually had a conversation with Karen Nelson, our GIS coordinator, who's going to help us uh, get Kent the right, the correct file. Um, and then the other um, the other report that Kent's worked on that we had a, another conversation about was the land the land use data. Um, so after reviewing that again today, Kent's going to make some. Uh, a couple of changes to it just to uh, um, make it so when you read it, it's more in order and people will, I think will better understand it. And Kent's also willing to give us a presentation about mm. the data collected at our possibly at our next meeting. So that's a tentative, but I'll reach out to all of you with our um, an agenda, a pre-agenda list. Yes, Molly. And I was guilty of not following up with what I said I was going to do. I need to contact Kent also and um give him information about um, our goal, like what the streets are and the addresses of places that were our priorities so he can see if we met our priorities. Yeah, one of the things that I talked to Ken about today was adding a layer um, 
on there that examined the areas of you know, EJ, environmental justice areas, that, um, because that's not one of the criteria in that spreadsheet um, when I mm. built it originally. So hopefully Kent will be able to reflect that in a map mm. that shows uh, the tree planting, um, not only by ward, but in like an environmental justice area. So, um, and then combined with the, we need the data, the Davy resource group so we can have this all in one document. So we can actually look at our, um, our overall tree species profile to better understand where we stand, where we sit with um, our tree selection and how we've hopefully altered um, our, uh, our overplanting of, uh, you know, Acer for many, many years. So that, that'll be interesting um, because we, um, just for just for uh, Professor Rogan's information, um, we've planted about 2,000 trees. I think I mentioned that in my email. We've planted 2,000 trees uh, since 2015, which is about 20% of our inventory canopy that we had professionally done in 2016. So we're very uh, curious to see um, how we've impacted our, um, our 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 tree you know our tree population uh, throughout the city because we were very heavily weighed on uh, Acer and, um, and and Quercus, which was our main, our two main um, genus. So, um, but with that said, I will we'll dispense with that for the moment, but that is sort of the whole gist of us. And Kent is a volunteer who is working with us um, that uh, worked with the uh, city of Cambridge, um, distilling uh, quite a bit of data that they had as well. And I appreciate um, all of Kent's hard work on this. Um, so thank you, Kent. I know you're in the background there somewhere. So thank you, Kat. You're welcome. Enjoy it. How oh, good. <laughs> uh, yeah, Molly, if there's other regions that you want called out, you should let me know. Right now I've got the EJ regions, the wards, and then just looking by planting project. But if there's specific ge other geographical regions. Yeah, there are some more. For example, the gateway areas to the city like Pleasant Street, Elm Street. That kind of thing and and there's other ones too okay well let me know i will and I'll, i can add those to the report okay thanks sure and rob can come at five all right perfect good all right great thank you hey hey jen welcome we we've dispensed with the minutes already so you you got out of that uh you didn't have to deal with that so we're <laughs> okay sorry about that I that's just, all right we're all good caught up doing something else sorry um does anyone have any quick questions or comments before i turn it over to professor rogan no all right so i um i was uh blessed with listening to uh, professor rogan at the mass tree wards and foresters association annual conference this year i also um we uh, also i watched uh, or listened to a presentation that he did uh back in uh I think it was June of 2022 at the Tree City USA award ceremony, um, which was in Lemonster. I can't remember. I think it was Lemonster. And um, the the work that uh, Professor Rogan has uh, been doing with his uh, with his staff and students has been ex is extremely interesting. And I think that you will find that it's sort of right up our alley because we are sort of like our own Greening of the Gateway Cities program at a, at a local level. Um, and Dr. Rogan has done a lot of studies on uh, urban heat island effect uh, regarding um, um, in the city of Worcester and their whole replanting effort. And then uh, they he's also branched out and uh, been working with DCR to examine the urban heat island effect on um, their Greening of the Gateway Cities program and some of their larger communities. So. Without further ado, Professor Rogan, thank you for coming today. We really appreciate you making the effort and time, and we really look forward to uh, listening to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate uh, the invitation. It's, it's very nice to see you and meet you. I'm going to share my screen, and, and hopefully that will go well. I think you just have to give me permission. You should be good. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. Hopefully you can see the screen okay. Okay. So um, I'm a professor at, at Clark University in, in Worcester and uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the group of students that I've worked with and also my colleague, Deborah Martin. And um, uh, before I get into 
discussing the motivations for our work and our findings, I'd just like to share that uh, I'm happy to give these slides uh, to you if they're helpful. Uh, I can send them in an email to, to Rich. And if there are questions that you have, I'd be happy to answer those both today and if there's any follow-up questions. So I think <clears throat> it's fair to say that uh, Deb and myself are um, learning as we go uh, about urban tree canopy and its, its benefits and um, any way we can help communities, uh, we're, we're very happy to do so. So it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and the title is Examining Urban Tree Planting Efforts to Mitigate Heat Island Impacts and Foster More Resilient and Equitable Cities in Massachusetts. So as a brief introduction, uh, as a geography department uh, at Clark University, uh, we're now actually in our centennial, we're, we're uh, in our 100th year of existence as a, a geography department uh, at Clark University. And another milestone we have is that the Human Environment Regional Observatory, or HERO program, is about to enter its 25th year. So we've worked with predominantly undergraduate students on a variety of projects over time uh, every summer and uh, these photos just give you an, a, an example of the students on the leftmost photograph students interacting with the DCR um, uh, foresters there in this case it's Matt Cahill who led the Greening the Gateway Cities program uh, from its uh, beginning and he's now shifted into a new role in the DCR and uh, we go to different towns throughout the state. And uh, actually, that's Deb Martin in the rightmost photograph. Uh, you can see Deb there. And this is just an example on the right of uh, going to the field and meeting DCR foresters. In this case, it's Rachel DeMatte, who's uh, been working in Chicopee and Holyoke for a long time. And so essentially, the program is an immersion program where students with relatively little knowledge of uh, tree planting and the benefits of trees, but our geography or environmental science majors, they'll, you know, it's a selective process and they'll come and, and join the, the program in the summer and they learn a lot in the process. And so because the HERO program has been in continuous operation for many, many years, we've built up a database and catalog, so to speak, of town by town, what, the, what, what are some of the most key pieces of information we've learned uh, from doing this work over time? And I'm happy to share those with you uh, today. My hope this summer uh, is to revisit trees that were planted in northern Worcester and Burncoat and Greendale neighborhoods, which were the epicenter of the Longhorn Beetle eradication effort. Um, and so we're excited to go back and see how well after a decade or more of us initially measuring those planted trees, uh, what the survivorship uh, rates are like, uh, which species have done better than others. <clears throat> and a key component of this work also is uh, interviewing residents um, and neighborhood groups in order to you know, better understand what they've what they consider to be successful about uh, a broad tree planting strategy. And we can always learn more uh, with, with every interview. So I'll go over some of the, the work that we do, and then I'll end with um, a list of major findings, I, I would uh, describe it so. So these are our guiding questions. Um, we're by no means uh, finished answering them. Uh, but we're working on them. Uh, how, where, and why does tree canopy mitigate air temperature? Uh, what are the best situations for heat mitigation in environmental justice communities? That's been a focus of ours. Uh, what are the current and future energy benefits of tree planting in environmental justice communities? This question is motivated by the Massachusetts DCR's goal to uh, reduce the temperatures uh, within houses uh, in environmental justice communities through the planting of shade trees. And so shade tree planting has been a big focus of, of the DCR as undoubtedly this 
panel knows all about that. And lastly, what policies best support the multiple aspects of planting and stewardship for tree survivorship? And so one of the benefits that I have of working with my colleague Deborah Martin is we're geographers with distinctly different training. My training has been in uh, ecology and geographic information science, uh, whereas Deb's, Deb's training is much more on the social science and community engagement side. So we bring together uh, different takes on how tree planting programs can be gauged and, and understood in terms of their successes or failures. So you're gonna see a mix of that today. Um, how do we do our work? So uh, we do uh, surveys of both street trees and yard trees in the various communities that we work in. And so we've established protocols for data collection, largely based on Dr. Lara Roman's uh, research uh, with the US Forest Service in Philadelphia. And Lara Roman has, has been um, hugely uh, influential in terms of how we've gone about our work. And indeed, uh, Lara's, one of Lara's main motivations has been to provide standardized protocols so that when assessments are performed across the country and in different cities, that we can actually compare uh, correctly uh, rather than be, you know, sort of have data fall through the cracks of inconsistent measurements. So at a given site, we record um, several pieces of information in addition to the structure of the tree, such as the diameter at breast height, you can see it here in this photograph. But we also record the health of the tree based on the Lara Roman protocols, and then some of the climate, uh, local climate and um, air uh, assessments as well. So we record at the site humidity, surface temperature, air temperature, and ozone concentration. And the ozone concentration is added to by our measurement of uh, particulate matter 2.5 as well. So at the end of a field campaign for a given community, we're collecting a, a fairly large and detailed database that helps us then communicate uh, to residents and to foresters and to groups such as yours, um, what the current status is in, a, 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 you would call it a, a holistic manner. Um, a lot of surveys are performed where simply the tree structure and health is assessed, but we go that step further with our team to get a sense of local climate and, and air quality as well. And one of our chief motivations for doing this multi uh, attribute assessment is that we found through the years that community groups, the DCR, Worcester Tree Initiative and others, uh, they're uh, in need of some clear guidelines about the benefits of trees, even when they're on that very juvenile stage of just recently planted or have only just been planted within the, the first two or three years. And return on investment um, is something that we've not shied away from in terms of communicating the current and, and future benefits of, of trees, which you'll see as well. The, other side of our assessment, what we're doing uh, is, is uh, related to Deborah Martin's work, my colleague, which is to speak to people, speak to residents, uh, get IRB approval and ask both residents and also foresters, uh, Department of Public Works, tree wardens. We do a sort of a, a blanket survey of anyone who will talk to us. Um, and depending on which town we're in and which communities, uh, some DPW organizations are uh, more keen to speak to us than others. It just, right, Massachusetts just has that heterogeneous mix of, uh, you know, you only know what you're going to get when you go to a particular town. But we've learned a lot from that. And um, again, we'll, we'll get to those uh, results in a moment. That's just an example in this slide of... Uh, the types of questions that we ask of, of residents. Okay, so we got started in this work uh, in Worcester, um, which I call the natural experiment, when uh, in 2010, uh, the USDA arrived and began the eradication program for the 
Asian longhorn beetle, now known as the longhorn beetle. Um, and you can see in the aerial photographs there, tree canopy in 2008, and then in 2010, following the eradication effort. And we do a lot of work uh, around geographic information science and cartography uh, to assess the uh, acreage of uh, tree canopy lost uh, during you know, uh, uh, an eradication effort like this, and also how many trees and, and of what type. And these are the types of mapping efforts that we can do consistently in, in different different places and, and different um, towns. Okay, so the photographs on the left show, um, you may have seen these before, these were quite uh, prevalent when the uh, eradication effort was going on. This is, uh, this is Granville Avenue in North Worcester, it's in the Burncoat neighborhood. And um, there you're seeing the top photograph shows the USDA trucks and the foresters arriving. And you see it's big, it began in winter. So you're seeing the quite extensive tree canopy there. Post removal, then you see what the street looked like after it. And so it essentially looks like it's a completely different place uh, just with the, with the removal of trees. And residents spoke to that point many times. Uh, li uh, lifelong residents of the area um, would miss their turn or miss their their driveway because they were just used to seeing trees as that waypoint at which they they would turn and so some people bizarrely found themselves getting lost in their own neighborhood and it was beyond that uh, a, a traumatic experience for for residents um but the city acted very quickly uh the Worcester tree initiative was was established and uh, not long after the the trauma so to speak of the tree removal uh, tree planting began, and so in the in this the lowest photograph there, you can see Granville Avenue with its early stock, young stock of trees that, uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, will go to that area, and and streets nearby, and do a new assessment of uh, of growth, health, air quality, air temperature, and we'll talk to residents about their experience over time. Um, now that you know, the longhorn beetle issue is, is practically over in Massachusetts uh, from those I've spoken to. Uh, people, you know, we're talking about, you know, what what does the future hold and, and what do uh, residents feel about that? On the right hand side um, is an example of a map made with thermal imagery. I won't go into details on that just to save time and, and um, it may not be of direct interest to you, but it's straightforward for us uh, as a group to gather thermal imagery and map the um, trends in temperature. And in this case, it's related to tree removal. And so the any, anything that you see on the map and the focus is on northern Worcester here, if you see my cursor, um, that area had a five to 10 range increase in um, degrees Celsius uh, when comparing the same streets before the, the trees were removed versus after the tree remo were removed. So what we see here is that the exposure of sidewalks and asphalt roads and roofs that were hitherto blanketed with shade tree canopy are now exposed to the sun and are really just cooking up those streets. They're re-emitting that energy uh, and, uh, you know, when we do field work in these areas, be it a place where trees have been removed or an environmental justice neighborhood where tree canopy is below 10 percent, which is fairly low, um, we, we feel those heat effects uh, very, very strongly in the summer, uh, especially in heat wave conditions such as last summer, summer of 2022. Um, and that's in direct contrast to neighborhoods that have 20, 30, 40% tree canopy where the, the feel is a lot different uh, as you might imagine. So this type of mapping and analysis uh, helped us communicate to the DCR and residents and the Worcester Tree Initiative and anyone who would listen to us uh, just how important tree canopy is uh, because its absence in a, in a very stark immediate way 
uh, reveals this uh, heat island popping up in an area where it was not present before. Um, these are just some graphics that we've used to communicate with the, the DCR and others. Uh, the, the, the scatter plot that I'm pointing at uh, is for Burncoat and Greendale neighborhood. And on the y-axis, it's the increase in temperature in degrees Celsius uh, in areas that have um, that we're looking at in the imagery. And on the x-axis, it's percent tree canopy lost. So we're comparing what is the relationship or what is the association between temperature, uh, change in temperature and the tree canopy lost in an area. So we're seeing a positive association there. The, the amount of variance explained is, is 40%. And to boil that down to sort of a fact that we share, 10% loss in tree canopy cover in, in this area in Worcester results in a 0.7 degree Celsius increase in land surface temperature. Um, and those are similar trends that we're seeing. Uh, we can kind of flip that uh, equation, so to speak, and say, uh, if you increase canopy by a minimum of 10%, you're seeing an almost one degree Celsius decrease in temperature uh, as a direct result. Um, in the graph below, the axes are the same as they were, other than the fact that we've replaced tree canopy lost with a measure of um, loss over impervious surface. So we isolate places uh, and record their temperatures where tree canopy was lost over impervious. So clearly the inclination here is that tree canopy lost over grass um, or flower beds, so to speak, uh, are, are not the focus of this particular analysis. We're focused more on the relationship where uh, asphalt and concrete has been exposed due to the lack of canopy. Here we're seeing, a, a, again, a positive relationship, but it's, it's a much stronger association. It's a 50% of variance explained there. And to, again, boil that down into communicable numbers, a 10% gain in impervious surface, whether it's new surface added or it's just exposed due to the removal of canopy, that's an appreciable increase. It's a one, one and a half degree Celsius increase in land surface temperature. And this finding echoes some of the work that David Nowak has done um, at SUNY Syracuse. He's probably one of the leading researchers on urban heat island, and he produced the iTree tools uh, suite of, of models that we've also used. Um, you know, it's in a sense, the gain in impervious surface has a much more detrimental wow. impact on heat island. Uh, and so you need to add more trees uh, to offset the increase uh, or exposure of impervious surface. So covering impervious in any way, shape or form uh, using the necessary number of trees is, what, is what's going to get push you in the, the right direction in terms of, of heat mitigation. So with the types of data that we have, uh, we we're able to track and monitor over time. And so monitoring change over time with the types of data sets that we use is very useful because they're not just snapshots of time. We're actually able to track over the course of years uh, in the case of Worcester. So um, this is a graph at the bottom that has degrees Celsius on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, th those are the months of the year. And what we're plotting here are the median temperatures for the areas in uh, Burncoat and Greendale. And so the, gr the green line shows the temperature, the median temperature per month prior to tree removal. And then the dotted line shows the median temperature per month after tree removal. So it's resulting in several things we can uh, understand. One is that there's a 22% increase in land surface temperature in the summer months. This is when we have our heat waves, June, July, August into September. The second thing we can see here is that um, uh, urban tree canopy loss, uh, by looking at it as a seasonal phenomenon, 
uh, actually has extended the summer season or the potential for heat wave conditions anywhere from three to nine days. So, so this is a perhaps a curious thing to, to comprehend. What we're doing with the data is we're showing that the summer season and the potential for those heat waves to occur uh, is actually longer and is amplified by the fact that th that tree canopy has been reduced uh, in that way. So in a sense, we are looking at communities as their own local heat island phenomenon and environmental justice neighborhoods lend themselves well to that type of lens. And uh, we feel that that's a, a good way to uh, focus on particular areas rather than, you know, in, on the other hand, refer to average temperatures for an entire city, which essentially masks uh, the, the micro site uh, phenomena that, that are present. So um, that's a look at some of this uh, thermal imagery that's from the Landsat program, which is NASA's longest running civilian uh, suite of, of sensors. It was launched initially in 1972, and NASA has continued to upgrade and, and send up new sensors um, all the time, which gives us this great continuous record. So tax dollars at work uh, being, being shown to you there. Okay, so following the work we did in Worcester, the DCR pivoted towards uh, sort of taking the initiative from Worcester and understanding the benefits of tree canopy through this natural experiment, if you want to call it that. And then they formed the Greening the Gateway Cities program, which focuses on environmental justice areas within towns of Massachusetts that uh, basically have below average income uh, educational attainment uh, and tend to be on the upper side of um, minority groups, uh, etc. And so one of the probably most memorable findings of our work in, in Worcester around the Longhorn Beetle, um, this was from a professor at UMass Amherst, uh, Ben Weil, who was able to access national grid utility data for those communities that lost so many trees. And he produced a report that showed that uh, energy usage in uh, the communities that lost tree canopy increased by 30 to 40%. So people's utility bills increased by anywhere from 30 to 40%. And in speaking to residents, as we were you know, doing our work, they referred to the, their front door, um, the paint on the front door melting, um, the fact that they had to install air conditioners for the first time in their uh, time in their particular residence. And again, as a result, their utility bills increasing. So we certainly can see from this natural experiment that uh, local residents are paying the cost, both financially and otherwise, for the loss of trees, for the eradication of this particular species. So I can pivot now to, to work we've done in those environmental justice communities elsewhere. Okay, so uh, I've been impressed and, and uh, delighted that the city of Worcester has uh, in recent years, 2020, released uh, a, a plan, a sus green sustainability plan, where part of that plan calls for the planting of uh, new trees uh, in areas that need it most. And it's called the Green Worcester Sustainability and Resilience Strategic Plan. And uh, here's a view of Worcester. Uh, in this case, it's being mapped as uh, different colors representing uh, environmental justice criteria. So these are census blocks that have been colored or shaded uh, to represent the type of majority environmental justice criterion present. So to give you a look at this, so in yellow, there's a uh, minority uh, uh, present in those census blocks uh, above 25% um, of households are non-white. Uh, in income, these are the green areas, uh, annual median household income is equal to or less than 65% of the statewide uh, median. 
these are taken from um, Mass GIS's definitions for environmental justice criteria. But I'll hop down to the dark blue shade, which is the combination of all of those. It's minority, income, and what's called English isolation, which is 25% um, of households have no members of the family over 14 that speaks only English. So if you look at the, the pattern there, the center of Worcester is a dark blue collection of census blocks. Uh, and the western side of the city is in white, and it's where um, the higher income, uh, low amount of minority residents are. So if you focus on that blue area, I'll go to another map. And these, this map will refer to the same temperature data you've seen previously. Uh, this is the urban uh, surface temperature map for Worcester. And you can see that those neighborhoods that are just numbered in a particular way that helps us, those are the areas with the highest temperatures, uh, particularly this area in the north that I'm pointing at in Polygon 5, 3. These are areas with all of those combined environmental justice criteria. And so we've been working with the city using this type of data with you know, free land surface temperature data that provided by the NASA program and with high resolution maps. So on the left, you're seeing tree canopy at one meter. These are the types of data products that we can produce um, with our GIS capabilities. And there's a clear link there, of course, between if you look at uh, the center of the city, very, very low canopy cover. Uh, and if you flip over to uh, the, the heat island map, you can see that those are the hottest areas as well. So low tree canopy equals uh, some of the hottest regions. If you look at uh, zone three in the north of the tree canopy map, this is Burncoat and, and Greendale. And uh, that was not prior to uh, the, the longhorn beetle eradication. It uh, was not a, a quote unquote hot part of the city. But you can see in the um, heat island map that it has become uh, very similar to uh, lower income uh, areas of the city as a result of its tree canopy removal. So um, the effects of tree canopy on temperature uh, are um, undeniable. This example here, I'll just show you this, this area that's a dark blue, or sorry, uh, the coolest area that's blue here, uh, that's a conservation sanctuary. It's called Broad Meadow Brook. And it's uh, been in conservation since the 1990s. And it's a Mass Massachusetts Audubon wildlife sanctuary. That just gives you an idea of how effective 40% or higher tree canopy is in terms of uh, heat island mitigation. And just for fun, if you look at this blue dot, maybe you're already looking at it here. This blue dot that's in uh, blocks 34, uh, it shows up as a very, very large cool spot. And if you jump over here to the map on the left, you see this big building building footprint. And that is the Walmart uh, off of Route 146 that goes into Rhode Island. And Walmart painted that roof white with reflective white material uh, during the course of our work. So we saw that the Walmart went from a dark roof to a light colored roof. And it shows up as a big, big, cool area uh, surrounded by an area of a lot of heat. This is an industrial railroad port um, complex. So we can see a lot of geography and a lot of interesting things in these maps. OK, this is um, this was quite revealing to us. This is Worcester in one day. Uh, this is uh, the same place, but in three time periods. This is the air temperature at 6 to 7 a.m. August 20th. Uh, the same uh, place, same day, different time, 3 to 4 p.m. And this is the nighttime, 7 to 8 p.m. What we're seeing here is that in the morning, in the summer, a typical warm summer, hot and humid, uh, we can see that the maximum temperatures are those yellow tones those are along major streets, and those are in the 60 to 70 degree range in the early morning. 
What we see in the afternoon is for the entire city, everything is hot, everything is pretty hot. Uh, the maximum temperatures along major roads are on the 85 to 90 degrees. This faded area that I'm pointing my cursor at, this is again Broadmeadow Brook that I showed you in the previous slide, and it's in the 80s. So while the entire city is warm at the hottest time of the day, 3 to 4 p.m., uh, forested areas, areas with high canopy are still 10 degrees lower uh, than areas with no canopy and high density uh, asphalt, concrete, etc. This really stands out. This is the 7 to 8 p.m. Uh, rendition uh, of temperature. This shows the, the central business district and those neighborhoods and center census blocks with low canopy, essentially being abnormally warmer at 7 to 8 p.m. while the rest of the city is cooling down. So in the western edge of the city, uh, where quite close to Assumption College, if you're familiar with, with Worcester's geography. Uh, these are areas that have already returned to their cooler um, conditions as a result of evaporative cooling and shading by those trees that are there. Whereas in the central di business district, it has absorbed all of that heat from 3 to 4 p.m. and is now re-emitting it, uh, making the place uh, uh, in some cases, just as warm at 7 to 8 p.m. as it was at 3 to 4 p.m. So we're working with the city of Worcester to use this type of data and analysis to help prioritize particular places. Um, we, this is, again, examples of, of ways we communicate with the city of Worcester. Uh, this is temperature on the y-axis, and this is income. Uh, minority, English, and no environmental justice risk. So these are the environmental justice criteria, but now we've just created summaries or medians of those criteria uh, across the course of a day. So this is median temperature in the afternoon, so that's at 3 to 4 p.m., and you see that the median is in the 80s, even if it's on the right-hand side, a non-environmental risk region of the city. But when we flip to the nighttime or the evening, 7 to 8 p.m., we see that the non-environmental justice areas on the right have now dropped to 74 degrees. And if we go uh, and look at English isolation, it's uh, at least four degrees warmer uh, and uh, income and minority as well. So these are um, the types of graphics that we use to communicate with the city, uh, which areas are at most risk and by what amount. And so we're putting numbers to uh, perhaps conditions that we all have a good sense that we know about, but we want to provide empirical evidence to, to help move that um, Worcester Green uh, and sustainability plan forward. Okay. The, the tree uh, canopy story is, is very similar. Uh, across those environmental justice neighborhoods, uh, canopy cover is on average 30%. The English isolation areas, it's 15. And if you look on the left, the non-environmental justice neighborhoods are approaching 40 to 45%. And in the literature, empirical studies in um, urban forestry uh, contexts have reported over and over again that 35 to 40 percent canopy is a threshold at which the heat island effects are mitigated. Not entirely, but um, it's, it's, it's a threshold that a lot of empirical evidence is speaking to. And we're, we're finding the same type of um, evidence as well. Okay. Um, Different geography, but similar type of context. This is just an example of work we've done for the DCR. And this is the town of Chicopee, Massachusetts. You can see it here in the little inset map along the Connecticut River. And we're going to focus on this green polygon, which is the environmental justice neighborhood chosen 
by the DCR within the city of Chicopee. It has the lowest canopy, it has the highest reported temperatures, and it has the lowest income of um, the town of Chicopee. So in the map on the left, you can see the green dots are where trees were planted. There's very little existing tree canopy there in this area. And so the brown polygons you see are factories and, and manufacturing areas, uh, as some of which are in use and, and some are, are no longer in use. What you see in the middle map is the energy cooling in Chicopee that we modeled for 2018. That was the year of, um, of our analysis where we measured all of those trees and we were able to use iTree to calculate the ecosystem services provided. And we're just gonna look here at annual savings aggregated to these census blocks. So these are census blocks. Again, we use that as a, uh, a form of analysis because we can use them to dive into demographic information too. But the take home story is that for areas that have had a sizable amount of tree planting, their modeled annual savings are anywhere from 15 to 30 uh, dollars per year. If we use the iTree models capability to forecast, assuming only 20% mortality uh, in 2050, uh, the highest annual savings have jumped enormously to 90 to uh, $160 uh, in annual savings just within that census block. So if you were to report the total, you'd be looking at, at big numbers here. So the 30 year cumulative benefits uh, for just this area of Chicopee uh, in terms of energy saving is $157,000. And that's with 951 trees that have remained from the original of 1200 that were originally planted. And, you know, you can say a lot about models. Some people really like what models sh show and some are keenly aware of their limitations and generalizations. But this is just an example of how we're trying to take our field inventory data and use standard products and, and free data as much as we can and, and uh, communicate with, with the DCR and communities uh, numbers that they can uh, communicate with others. I think one of the biggest contributions I think this type of work could make is to give planting programs and communities a sense of some meaningful numbers. Um, the, the reason I bring this up is there's a, a context around ecosystem services that <clears throat> is, is quite grandiose, right? Where, you know, if people say, oh, how much benefits do trees provide? You know, there's all kinds of astronomical numbers that are quoted. And it's rare, I've found, that people go to the trouble of trying to just isolate particular areas and report benefits uh, on a much more constrained level. Um, and so, we're, we're, of course, we're working on, on these uh, analyses. And, um, you know, the bottom line that we also like to convey is that <clears throat> from this analysis, tree density of two or three trees per acre. So taking a, a unit of analysis of an acre, planting of two or three trees at a minimum uh, will give you the maximum benefit based on our models. Now, I was asked at the Tree Wardens common, uh, Conference, well, couldn't you plant more than two or three? And yes, absolutely. If there's you know, the right space for the right tree, more could be planted and indeed that does happen. But we are trying to communicate <clears throat> minimum levels of planting, <clears throat> excuse me, we're trying to communicate minimum levels of planting that can always be exceeded if the money and the wherewithal and the planting conditions are right. <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> I wanted to put this in here. This is newer information and Rich uh, asked me about it in a previous email. Uh, given the types of data we have that, that we can look at all places everywhere, we wanted to look at white roofs and, and the white roof coating phenomenon. And uh, this is another uh, 
factoid that we're sharing with, with communities. Uh, for every roughly half acre of roof, so if you were to have a half acre quantity of roof painted white or installed with solar panels, which absorb the temperature, absorb the heat uh, and make it cool, make those roofs cool, the white roofs simply reflect that energy and are as, as a result of having high albedo, they're reflecting the solar energy and are also cool in it for a different way. One reflects and one absorbs and converts that into power. Um, so we can say that a half acre, uh, all told, will give you a one degree Fahrenheit decrease. Um, and I've got some summaries here. These are um, some buildings in a neighborhood within Worcester called Green Island. It's the neighborhood that had, now has Polar Park, the, uh, the Woo Sox uh, baseball stadium. And it is one of the, it has one of the lowest incomes of any uh, neighborhood in Worcester and has the lowest tree canopy in Worcester. I think we measured the tree canopy at about 8%. So we're letting the city of Worcester know that when it coated its buildings with municipal buildings listed here on the left uh, with, with um, high albedo paint, um, it had the reduction in temperature of anywhere from two uh, to 1.5 degrees. In some case, uh, a reduction of almost three degrees. So these are again numbers to, to share and uh, I think demonstrate well uh, how the uh, action taken beyond tree planting, but actually dealing with, with roof coating as well uh, can actually make it a difference overall. So we see clearly that there are multiple strategies uh, with which cities can go about lowering temperatures. These are just a, a couple of those. So. Um, let's see, it's 5.26 now. Is this a good place to, to stop and, and ask for questions? Yes, oh. thank, thank you. Okay, Anyone? I wanted to leave time for, for any discussion or questions. I have a question. Just a um, can you just tell me again, you said a half acre of white roof or solar panels causes the temperature to go down. How much? That's one degree Fahrenheit. Oh, one degree F, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. have, uh, have, you, have you done any studies or are you planning on doing any studies where a combination of the two, um, where the planting of at least a minimum of uh, two to three trees per acre and um, converting the color of uh, roof, roofing material, have you done any research on that? Or I'm curious to see if, uh, yeah there's you know there we're always we've done a lot of work uh, in our community this commission in particular to talk about um different ordinances and uh how they relate to tree planting tree removal in mm -hmm. regard to a uh, building construction so i think it'd be really interesting from a um, an overall sustainable point of view to to better understand how those two we can see how they interact with by by what you described in your presentation um, but I'm just wondering if you've studied those two uh, together as a group in any particular location. That's a great question. We have not. Um, we've also, it's, a, it's something we, we certainly could do. One of the interesting things is that we've not seen instances where tree planting and white roofs have occurred in a similar place. I think white roof coating um, is happening in places where tree planting isn't viable. Um, I don't know if that's always the case. Um, you know, there's the sewers and the overhead power lines and all of those restrictions for, for trees. Um, but I think at a census block level, we could certainly look at where the, they occur together and, and look at those values. That's a really good point. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of dialogue in, in obviously in Massachusetts and trying to become carbon neutral about how we can maximize how we can maximize the benefit of uh, increasing our urban canopy cover, but also by utilizing um, the individual communities that have adopted a stretch code um, mm -hmm. to make their buildings more efficient, but also the fact that there seems to be a lot of uh, 
not enough funding to retrofit existing buildings to uh, to actually you know insulate them, um, make make them solar reflective or solar absorbing for a purpose other than just creating um, heat. And I, I guess that's my sustainability, my energy. I'm on the energy. I'm on the Energy Sustainability Commission, and we're always having this conversation um, about how to try to uh, approach this in a balanced way. Um, because we are, we're, you know, our main focus is our urban tree canopy. But as a commission, and I'll, and anyone, please stop me if I'm speaking out of turn. But we seem to be dragged into the conversation about um, zoning and building construction and how the, how the two um, are uh, not not very friendly mates. I guess I would say because it's always, you know, I need to build this house here, but in order to do that, I have to cut this tree down. So I think uh, in order to to reach the levels of carbon neutrality that we're um, that we're thinking about, it's we have I think as a commission we realize that it's a balanced, it's a very balanced or very nuanced approach. Um, it's not just you know we're not going to build any more homes. Um, we're just going to plant trees. It's not we're just we're just going to build green uh, carbon neutral homes and not plant any trees. It has to be a balanced approach to it, and I think that's like anything in life, but. Mm -hmm. I think uh, considering the amount of building construction that's going on um, throughout the Commonwealth, and at least uh, from our perspective, our community, it's it's been quite a conversation topic. Yeah, yeah, um, you know, you're, you're just right. Uh, we've had issues and conversations with the City of Worcester around the American Disabilities Act and the requirement that sidewalks be accessible um and and essentially retrofit uh, so to speak to be more accessible and that can run at odds with tree planting uh in terms of width and 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 the like right of way etc we've also seen in worcester where permits for solar roof uh development in in private homes has resulted in residents cutting shade trees in their yard so that they can receive the requisite sunlight uh, for the solar panels to be to be maximized or the benefit to be maximized uh there's that's another conflict and and just a little bit further just because i've done this work massachusetts audubon asked us to they just called us up and said what's going on with ground solar there's a lot of ground solar throughout massachusetts and long story short we mapped all of the solar throughout Massachusetts and found that half of it, half of all ground solar installations have resulted in deforestation uh, in order to install those solar panels uh, on the ground, which surprised me. Um, so I think there is, there's a lot of conflict there um, uh, and there's different sides to, to the argument um, to make it all work. Have you um, done any data work? This isn't about tree planting, but um, there's a couple parking lots like in Amherst that have uh, put solar panels above the parking lots, like on the campus of UMass Amherst. Have you done any data collection on on those parking lots with solar, without solar? Yeah, that's a great point. <clears throat> they work, they work extremely well. They cool the area that before was the hottest place in the school uh, grounds. Uh, Worcester's had a few, Burncoat High School is one example. Um, when I spoke to the Massachusetts Commission, um, whose name escapes me now, but it's the commission that oversees energy programs and they were behind the solar incentives. Uh, very interesting conversation with them when I brought the solar deforestation connection up. And they said that what they would like if they could have infinite amount of money would be to cover every parking lot with solar. And it's, you know, the material costs of that are extremely high, but it, you know, it does work. It absolutely does work if it happens. Yeah, Molly, you have to unmute yourself, Molly. Oh. Sorry about that. Um, 
John, how did you say you got those maps that showed the temperature cloud? Mm -hmm. How did you yeah. get that? So, so the, the, the imagery that we use has a pixel for anywhere you want to look and it's recording that the temperature. And so what we can then say is, was tree canopy lost there or was impervious surface exposed? And we know that from our field work and, and uh, from our, our GIS work. So we're able to then do case by case comparisons to show what was the effect on temperature by A, removing canopy, uh, or B, removing canopy and it being over a sidewalk or over a, uh, you know, uh, asphalt road. But how did you actually monitor the temperature? I mean, how do you do that from a photograph or, or satellite pictures or whatever? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So the data, your tax dollars at work, right? So your your the sensors collect the the same information very very frequently. So in some cases, twice a month or or once a week. So we can track that those same pixels, those same places, over time, and then look at the changes brought about by tree loss or, or tree planting. But it's from a like something up above that's looking down on yeah, it. Yeah, it's, it's above the earth. Yes, so it's Satellite? 800, 800 kilometers above the earth. And oh. we, we calibrate those data with our field measurements. So we, we have in the field measurements as well. Oh, wow. That's amazing that it could be that far away and that sensitive. Yes, it's uh, I mean, to, to the layer of a road or a yeah. individual building or whatever. Yeah, the, 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 we've been very lucky to be able to use that that data, the, the archive of Landsat um, is free and the, the US Geological Survey has taken over the management of that data set from NASA and have done a really good job with uh, making sure it was calibrated, uh, making sure it was free. Uh, when I was in graduate school, which is a while ago, uh, those, those images, one image costs about $5,000. Yeah. So that limits a lot of what you can do um, with data, but now it's free. And uh, I'd say that the Landsat program is probably one of the most successful things that NASA has done for Earth uh, as, as an organization. Hmm. Um, just as an aside, I, meant, I saw in the paper today that Lindsay Sabadosa, who's our state rep, um, she's co-sponsoring a bill this coming year about um, uh, prioritizing solar panel installation on buildings and uh, impervious surfaces rather than forests and land. Yeah. Yeah, I think that will make a lot of people happy because I've spoken to residents in towns that have turned against solar because they feel that just got to be too much and they're not able to block solar because the plans for it have already been agreed. So they're anti-solar, but can do nothing about new solar going on because the contracts have been already written mm. up three years prior. Mm. Very frustrating for people. Uh, the, 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 I've been in, in conversations with many groups at the same time, right? So Mass, um, Massachusetts Audubon Society brought us all together. And there are a lot of very different opinions about solar, uh, uh, ground solar. Um, um, you know, for example, uh, farming communities and, and uh, land trusts with a, a rural agricultural uh, focus see solar as being very beneficial to farms that want to supplement their income. Um, and, you know, so it's, it's a complicated matter. Uh, David. Uh, uh, great presentation. Thank you for all your work on this. Um, it seems that trees can cool uh, down the, herb, the heat island effect by either reflecting light or cooling the air through transpiration. But I, I'm curious if you've studied sort of w w the how trees do it. Um, yeah. Because I think like the tilia cordata, the little leaf linden is famous for transpiring 400 liters of water a day. And that's something you're not gonna get 
if you paint rooftops white or install solar panels. Great point. Um, nothing, there's, there's no better machine than a tree to, um, to take care of urban heat island. Um, grass is a, I call it a, a poor substitute to, to trees. Trees at sufficient height will shade significantly the surfaces that are generating the heat and they, they're evaporative coolers at the same time. So I, I agree with you. It's, um, and, and even different types of tree are going to perform differently. Uh, you know, Dawn Redwoods are popular uh, in, as a street tree. They're quite hardy, but you're not going to get the same canopy as, you know, a sycamore or uh, what else is very popular these days. Ginkgos are very popular among communities, but ginkgos don't have the wildlife benefits that natives do. You know, there's lots of conflicting um, multi-criteria types of uh, analyses to be done there. Um, yeah, it's an excellent point. Yeah, roofs are not going to provide the additional benefits that trees do. But I think where trees cannot be planted, they're a good alternative. Uh, to, to David, to your point, I there brought up, uh, I listened uh, to a, um, a talk given by uh, Professor Nick Brzee, who's the uh, plant uh, pathologist uh, for UMass Extension. And he, he uh, was going over some factoids yesterday in this quick one hour Zoom call that I was on. He said that uh, a review of 50, 52 studies between 1970 and 1996 observed that 90% of observations found that daily water use for a tree that it was 70 feet tall was anywhere from 30 to 53 gallons a day. And even that those also were um, obviously um, in high drought period as well. So I think it's really interesting. I think there's so many factoids um, surrounding the benefits of trees that that's just amazing. 53 gallons of water, that's a lot of water for mm -hmm. a tree. I mean, I and I granted, I, but just think about where the trees are located. Uh, like in Professor Rogan's maps, they're, uh, they're in the urban heat island, but those trees are still needing at least a minimum if they're that size, you know, 53 gallons of water a day to survive. So if you think about it, we're, we're, plant, we're watering trees at uh, 20 gallons a week in the middle of the summer, and they're only, um, you know, two and a half inch mm -hmm. caliper. And we're trying to keep them alive while 70 foot trees are, are you know, basically drinking 25 more gallons or, or 30 more gallons of water to support their whole ecosystem. It's pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. But um, um, I, my, uh, I have another question, another question for Professor Rogan. If, if we were interested, and I don't, I'm not trying to make more work for you, but if we were, if you were interested in doing some kind of analysis for the, for the Northampton, similar to what you're doing in Greening the Gateway Cities, would that be possible? Yeah, I think so. Um, I appreciate uh, you asking. I think that, uh, you know, we as a team, I'm speaking for the team that aren't here, of course, but uh, we're very interested to see what we can learn from these new places. Uh, and um, you clearly have in your city a great, well-organized team. Um, you know, at Worcester, for example, is trying to get a tree commission such as yours up and running and uh, and they're having some difficulty. I think they'll get there in the end. So I'm, I'm very happy to, you know, we could have a follow up conversation and, and see what what your needs are. And 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 yeah, happy to. Thank you, uh, Sue. You're, you're, you're muted, Sue. Oh. As I listened, I was trying to think about some goals we could come up with. And um, did I understand correctly that 35 to 40% canopy is a threshold at which the heat island effect is mitigated? Yes, okay. exactly. I yeah. got that right. And yeah, exactly right. And so from Madison, Wisconsin to Worcester, Massachusetts, um, empirical studies, they have, they have different methods depending on where you are, but we're seeing that number 
being reported a lot more. Um, you, we did a study in Worcester that I haven't spoken about where we looked at sensors that we put uh, on the ground all over the city, rooftops and everywhere, and, uh, and looked at the tree canopy in, uh, in those places. And sure enough, when it was going from 35 to 40 percent, that's where we saw the dip in all of that variability caused by warming up during the day, staying hot in the night. Um, it, that number needs a lot more examination and, and, and uh, as we always would want to do more testing. But I feel confident in sharing any of these numbers with you because we've, we've tested them and we've double checked them. And the one or two threes per acre is something that we would stand by. Um, I don't know what $157,000 cumulative energy benefits directly means to a community who have more than just that to deal with, but I think it is a more reasonable number than, oh yeah, trees will give you millions of dollars and all of that, you know, and there's a lot of arm waving. And uh, so we're, we're conscious to, to try to provide some useful numbers that are something you can aspire to. There are gonna be places that won't have 30 to 40 percent canopy, but could a city achieve that or places in a city? And um, can I just throw in one more point that I'm this just jogged my memory. In places where existing tree canopy, existing tree canopy is at 10% or less. So you're in a place like Green Island and Worcester and, and tree canopy is low. One negative thing we found, unfortunate thing, is that um the cooling benefits are very very low and in some cases non-existent at the early stage of planting because the trees aren't making any significant impact uh where there's no or low pre-existing canopy in other words the benefits of tree planting at the early stage are best seen witnessed uh, when there's some existing tree canopy, I'll put a number on it, like 20 or 30%. There's that aggregate effect. And, and what it makes me worry a little bit about communities that have low tree canopy uh, having to wait a long, long, long time before those benefits arrive. Uh, it's something that, I'll be honest with you, it's something that I was hoping I wouldn't see, but we did see that, that it's, you're starting from, literal scratch and there's so much concrete and asphalt that um unless you know some towns as you know are are starting to remove uh, asphalt and, and trying to put in some um you know drainable eco streets but that's tremendously expensive i was in rhode island with the, the uh, east providence with the groundwork rhode island um communities there that look a lot like parts of Worcester, lots of uh, buildings, lots of manufacturing, a lot of air pollution there, which is something we haven't seen in Worcester. Um, and they, Groundwork Rhode Island has this great relationship with the city of Providence, where they will open up tree planting pits in sidewalks. Uh, so essentially you're creating space where there is none and of course it's a dig safe thing and all of that and i've not seen that in worcester or other towns i was very impressed to see groundwork push that forward to overcome many obstacles and, and do that and that's going to help because you're facing in environmental justice communities the twin trouble of not avail not a lot of available planting space and low canopy to begin with so um as I said, I, and I think I say this every time, I've learned a lot just from going to different communities and seeing what they've tried to do to make things work. So. Um, I understand that the complete street philosophy of having a lot of sidewalks, wide sidewalks, bike lanes, all this infrastructure for walking and biking, um, it actually comes down from the federal level 
And is there any movement to address that nationally since funding comes down, the state says you have to have the complete streets and there's not a lot of flexibility. And I'm not against biking and walking by any means, but just that the flexibility isn't there sometimes in a neighborhood where you have these, you know, it's just street sidewalk building. That's it. I mean, the idea of drilling, you know, making these tree pits in sidewalks <laughs> seems mm -hmm. like far off. It's yeah. national. You know, that, that's something I don't have a lot of experience with. I, I know with complete streets that <clears throat> business districts that want to attract walkers, you know, cyclists, they'll do these uh, planters and they'll, they'll put greenery in that way. They're obviously going to be smaller, but they... Um, add something and um, in towns that I've worked in with contaminated soil planters are required because they're not allowed to move that soil at all and so um, it's a don't ask don't tell scenario where you just you cover up that area and you're putting greenery in where you can so um, but I'll be honest I don't know too much about the the federal side of things and, and that mandate. Very interesting. Is, any, is anyone else, anyone from the public have any questions? We have a couple of people from the public. Uh, Kent. Yeah, hi, thank you for your presentation. I'm curious uh, how you generate your tree canopy data. What data sources and what kind of processing you do use for that? Yeah, thank you. Um, so we've used, uh, I, you call it an old fashioned method where we're doing surveys of uh, trees in parks, along streets, um, and in, in residences where we are allowed to access. And so we're, we're going tree to tree in, in teams. Um, we typically work eight weeks uh, consistently in a summer with groups of students with that, that program that I noted earlier. And we're just putting it in a database and then, you know, adding to that database as we go. Um, we have worked with Davey on their software to, you know, click and point on, on trees. I forget its name right now, um, but it's, uh, it uses Google Maps to have you identify a tree in an image and then you click on it and you can enter the data that way. So um, you, um... Your maps showing tree canopy, those are all from on the ground surveys? That's our primary way. The oh. second is to do mapping with LIDAR and um, high resolution imagery, um, which um, is good when the data are available. So not LIDAR data are not collected as consistently as the Landsat program that I noted. Sometimes LIDAR data are only available perhaps every four years. Um, usually the federal government will pay for it to happen if there's something like Hurricane Sandy and they want to do a, a large area assessment. Um, so that's one thing the state of Massachusetts lacks is uh, a modern, you know, up-to-date LIDAR data set. But the LIDAR data set are, sets are, once you have them, they're quite easy to manipulate and, and make tree canopy products. Um, there's a group out of University of Vermont that I've worked with and they have produced most of the large tree canopy data sets for New York and uh, Boston, Philadelphia. Um, and, um, you know, they, they sort of have cornered that market for that type of work. Um, so yeah, it's so the, the field inventory work and also that the mapping that we do with imagery or the ways that we just collect that data. Thank you. Thank you. And anyone else have any other questions before we let Professor Rogan go home? <laughs> um, I just wanna say thank you very much. I, I really have enjoyed uh, this presentation. I've enjoyed your other presentations that I've seen and. Um, I'm, I'm actually, uh, I'll reach out to you in an email and, um, try to, uh, try to figure out how, uh, if, if, if it's possible for you to partner with us to do some, to do some data 
collection and some research because I think it would be really interesting because we're we are in the process of trying to gather data to uh, determine our percent canopy, mm -hmm. um, also uh, our percent canopy loss over a period of time, mm -hmm. um, and determining whether or not we have enough canopy loss or we have enough tree loss either through public public trees, conservation trees, and private trees to actually implement a our, our work on a citywide tree ordinance uh, that would protect trees uh, on pro on all properties above a certain uh, DBH, um, similar to what Cambridge did. Okay. So we're still like in the fact in the, uh, the fact gathering mm -hmm. stage of things to try to determine how we, how the, we want to you know what direction we want to go in. So I think this is a a very important component because I think we talk a lot about the urban heat island and trying to mitigate the urban heat island. Um, and I think, you know, I just think about the planting we did at Cooley Dickinson Hospital. I think we planted, I don't know, Jen, remind me, how many, did we plant 19 trees? Maybe there, we planted 19 trees in, in, a, in a strip. Something about that, I think. That was probably um, a quarter, a quarter of a, a, of a, of a soccer field. Mm -hmm. You know, so a grove, and I'm just thinking about all the trees were never there before, and now we've planted these trees, and now the long-term effects of it, you know, it's right next to a road, it's also right next to a parking lot, it's next to a very large building. So I think um, it's really important. I think I think I was sort of blown away when I first heard you talk earlier this year about just having three trees planted mm -hmm. um, in, in an acre, and that's like half of a football field. Which just it, from a from perspective just blows me away that those three trees in that large area because I still think a half football field is kind of large. I, I used mm -hmm. to manage sports fields all the time, mm -hmm. and it's just amazing to me. And I think about all the work that we've done in Northampton, planting in groves and planting in um, rows and areas within the city that didn't have shade trees before. Um, it'll be interesting to have all that data and see where 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 we're at and see if you know the benefits in dollars dollar amounts not just that mm -hmm. you know these trees are worth 39 million dollars in benefits you know having real data sets that actually uh talk uh can really talk to people so yeah no i think it's it's wonderful uh what you've been doing i um uh learned a lot from working with molly freilicker who uh worked for dcr and you may have met with molly she's now left the dcr um, and, um, you know, I believe she lived near Northampton as well. And, um, you know, it's a great city. I've been to a few good concerts there as well. Some great music comes through that, that city. And, uh, you know, I would hope that we'd have an opportunity to speak, uh, of course, about what you're interested in doing. And um, I think you're right. The, there's a um, data gap and an information gap um that the types of products that we produce um can help with uh there's no substitute for field data and and the like but uh they they uh they're they're assets that the government has particularly the landsat program that you know unless you're in a, a university setting and a geography program you may not know that they even exist uh yet they've been around for 40 years Yeah, I, uh, Kent has been Kent has opened my eyes to all the data that's that is available that's open source, mm -hmm. um, and working on these two different projects that Ken has taken on. So it's very interesting um, how much information is out there that's not really tucked away in some government office in a shelf that we can't access. So, um, so yes, I, I will follow up with an email, um, and if uh, anyone in the commission has any thoughts as to information that you think would be uh, helpful that Professor Rogan and his uh, students could capture, please send me an email. I would appreciate your input. Um, thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. Uh, Sue, you had your hand up? So oh, just that um, an ongoing, another ongoing theme we've had is the benefits of small trees versus large trees. And it's, you know, that's real complicated, it sounds like, because the different species of trees and placement and everything but just to throw that in that that's another topic that keeps coming up like the small trees versus saving large trees yeah 
Our lights just went out here. Give me one second, sorry. <laughs> Someone turned out the lights. How can you, talk, speaking of energy saving. <laughs> <laughs> the solar panel, the solar panel shut off on top of the building. You know, they, uh, sorry about that. Um, uh, so they brought in these automatic lights. So if you don't move much, they'll turn off the lights. And so lo and behold, it had to happen while I was uh, speaking. Um, so yeah, we've looked, sorry, we've looked at, uh, and we've more work to do, but the shorter trees that are, you know, would be fit for planting under utility wires and the like, they're, uh, they, they call those, um, live fast, die young, right? So they, they don't have the longevity. So the service berries, the cherry trees, et cetera. And those are also popular with tree advocacy groups because they flower, they've got a nice look to them. And homeowners in particular are often concerned about trees overtopping their house uh, because of ice storms and wind storms. So there's a psychology to it as, as much as anything else. But um, yeah, hopefully we can have some of these discussions in, in the future as well. Thanks, sorry to hold us up. No, it's great. You know, um, they're shutting the lights off. That's a sign that they want me to go home, I think. Uh, that's like in the Oscars when they play the music, when they're, <laughs> they're still having a speech, you know. I just feel so bad for them when they do that. So anyway. <laughs> and we're supposed to end at six, so here we oh, are. Oh, there we go. Okay, yeah. great. Th th thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Um, and uh, I, I, will, uh, I will be in touch. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, I just need a motion from someone in a second to adjourn the meeting because it is six o'clock. I'll move to adjourn the meeting. May I have a second? I'll please? second it. All right. Uh, all in favor, just raise your hands. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Professor Rogan. Uh, thank you for thank you, folks from the public as well.